Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pat Majitti. I'm the provost here at Villanova University. It's an honor to serve in that role. Um, there have been so many great things going on here academically. And uh, in large part, that is because of our leadership. And so uh, I'm very excited to have um, the majority, actually, of our academic leaders here in this session. Um, and, and very proud and, 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 and pleased that uh, I was ask, asked to have a role in this uh, session. So we're going to talk a little bit about leadership and women leadership, particularly in the university setting, but even in a more general context. But before we do, I thought I would introduce uh, the individuals to my left. And first and foremost amongst them is Dr. Del Linda Meyer, who is the Dean of our College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Uh, she's been at Villanova for some time now. She's a, actually a professor <laughs> in our history department. I let her say that. That's true. Um, prior to that, she's been dean of the history department and dean of our uh, school, our graduate programs in the in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, uh, and just has been a, a phenomenal leader for that our most central and foundational college. Dr. Deb Tixinski is next to her. She's the dean of the College of Professional Studies. She is the founding dean of that college. Um, uh, so that's uh, uh, something I think that is particularly interesting about her background. She came to us from uh, SUNY Polytechnic uh, after a long career there uh, and in industry. And uh, I am pleased that she is part of the Villanova community and has, has really shown herself to be a true Villanova over the last couple of years since she's arrived. Uh, <laughs> next, next, we have. Um, Interim Dean Leslie Perry, who's Interim Dean of the College of Nursing. Uh, Leslie has had a phenomenal academic career, uh, both at the um, New Jersey School of Nursing and at the University of Maryland, my alma mater, uh, for my doctorate anyway. Um, she has been at Villanova for a number of years, serving basically as Dean Fitzpatrick, our, our beloved Dean who recently passed away as her right-hand person, and uh, she has just been doing a, a terrific, a terrific job um, uh, when both Lu when Louise was out for a time, but now serving in the interim role while we launch into a search for a, a new dean of nursing. And last and certainly not least, Dr. Joyce Russell, who uh, is dean of the Villanova School of Business. She came to us last year, uh, a little bit more than a year ago, um, from the University of Maryland as well, again. Uh, I, I have nothing to do with these people coming to Maryland. There's something in the water down there. Uh, Joyce is, is uh, an industrial psychologist, so she does a lot of work around HR issues and leadership itself, and uh, is actually, um, in addition to being a published scholar, she's, she, you can find a column from her, I think, in the Washington Post. Is that where you have on career advice and things? So. We have certainly an esteemed panel to, uh, to talk about issues around leadership and women's leadership in particular. Um, it's an interesting case at Villanova because as all of you know, you know, we were an all male school for many years and legacies of that uh, existence still, um, I think are, in, in, are still part of the fabric, you know, and they're part of the legacy and, and, and structural uh, organization, you know, as I look even at amongst the cabinet and the leadership, you know, there's still a, a large number of, of men in leadership roles, and, and again, you know, we're talking about an organization that's founded by an order of male friars, so it's to be expected, but it also presents its own um, interesting challenge. I ex challenges I expect uh, for for women, um, and I certainly don't pretend to understand them. I am I'm also an observer observer of some of those things probably a participant at some times, I would imagine. Um, so uh, my first question is for Adele and Joyce. Um, it relates to that. So um, here at Villanova, despite this sort of male founding, we now have a majority of our academic deans. There's six academic deans. Four of them are women. And so uh, does that make a difference? Uh, you know, what, what is it like to be uh, a part of an organization that at least has critical mass and even a majority of, of women in this leadership role here at Villanova. Adele, you want to start or? Let's, that let's let you start, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I need a mic, but, uh, and I see one of our Dean colleagues back there, so keep that in mind, ladies. <laughs> dean Gary Gabriel's here, 
um, from College of Engineering. We're glad you're here. And a huge um, supporter of women. Yes. Huge supporter, Absolutely. exactly. Right. Um, well, I think um, for me, it, it is really different um, having a lot of female colleagues uh, because in business, as many of you know, you're usually one of the only um, for women. It's still heavily male dominated, and especially in certain um, sector, so I'm just used to always being one of the few, if only women in the room. So it's really a different experience, and um, but I think it's really nice um, in terms of it, it. You know, it's it's fun, it's collaborative. I mean, we always talk about the fact that we get along really well. I think we do get along well even with our male colleagues, though, because they're extremely supportive. So um, you know, Gary Gabriel and Mark Alexander are other deans. Um, and then, of course, Leon. Um, but, you know, Pat talks about it being mostly um, women, but we do have a lot of other men that are in the room, too. <laughs> uh, so I never feel like it's overwhelmingly female. Um, but I do think it, it makes for a really collaborative experience. And it's, it's, it's a different experience um, for me, just from my history. So I find it to be really um, enjoyable. Uh, so, I think obviously there's a symbolic significance. That's why we're having this panel. So it causes people to sit up and take notice that in quite a short time, I'm not good at these. So in a very short time, we, it's 30 years in the classroom. A very short time, a really dramatic difference took place in that you had uh, the leadership of the majority of colleges change to women, uh, some of whom came from the outside and uh, some of whom had been here a long time. I remember the, one of the first times I remarked on this to a longtime colleague here at Villanova and she remarked, uh, yes, what does that tell you about the power of a position that's now held by so many women? So that rather less than congratulatory uh, <laughs> observation <laughs> has actually made me think about the association of a position and the gender of the person who occupies it. Uh, I'm not gonna make any particular pronouncements about that because it's something that I'm still thinking about, but we still do have very gendered ideas of power. And we have very gendered ideas of how people in authority, authoritative positions are supposed to behave. Uh, I also asked one of our male colleagues just earlier today what uh, he thought uh, the difference was that four of the six uh, de academic deans are women. And he said, well, it makes the conversations at the Council of Deans much more interesting. <laughs> so, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> so I'll just stop with those provocative <laughs> comments. <laughs> and I also want to add another is that he's our boss. So here we are speaking about, and he's a wonderful boss. He is a really, truly wonderful person to work for. But it is slightly interesting to be on this panel. I agree, and have me be the moderator. Correct. It's not yes. lost on me. And it was planned so that I could monitor yes, everything yes. that was said, and that's nothing to do with being women. Um, I guess, I, I don't know if you want to add anything, if the other two deans would, but I'm, I'm interested, you all have your own leadership teams where you have men and women, so from that view down, what do you do to make sure that women are heard or that there is a fair, you know, voicing of opinions and, you know, there are different styles, at least generally speaking, when you are in groups of individuals. So I'm curious, you know, tactics that you might use or what you, you might think. Yeah, I would just add to that that I think that's a great question. And I think that in the business school, we're very purposeful about our appointments and our leadership positions, um, particularly because it is a male-dominated industry for the most part. 
So generally business schools have, you know, mid 30% of women faculty, um, obviously significantly more women staff. Um, but I think we think about it, I certainly think about it really carefully as you look at your department chairs, your associate chairs, your associate deans, and um, ensuring that you have as, that you think carefully about those appointments that you make and um, because you're sending a message, right, about what's really important to you and the importance of having women in leadership roles and then having diversity in those roles, I think sends an important message. So every decision we make, uh, you know, we think carefully about. And so we do have a fair number of women in leadership in the business school. Um, and we have a strong effort to try to get more women faculty and then get, to get them promoted to higher levels because that's a challenge for all of us, I think. Um, and then that's good mo modeling for our students, right? Because our students want to have women in the classroom. Um, they actually bring that up a lot and they want to have women in leadership positions. So, I mean, I think we're very strategic and thoughtful about the decisions that we make ensuring that we have some diversity. Well, you know, before we, I, I would turn it over, you, and uh, Deb and Leslie, you can add things uh, as you see fit, but I wanted to ask a question more directly to you as we move on um, about just sort of some of the general challenges uh, that you face as women uh, leaders and what types of advice you give uh, other women who are aspiring leaders. I think if you just lay this on the table, it works, seems to work pretty nice. Start with Leslie. So, well, uh, nursing is actually a predominantly female um, profession, and so, um, you know, I deal mostly with women in the College of Nursing, and we have a, we have a few men, but very few, so that's our challenge, is actually to become more diverse in terms of gender diversity. We're going to um, trade people. Right. <laughs> Good idea. Um, but, so, in terms of what are the challenges I've experienced as a woman leader, you know, I'm, I'm not sure they're different than from my perspective or my experience because I've not really had a, uh, a lot of experience in having to deal with a lot of men in, in my professional career. Um, but probably um, trying and having only now been uh, in this position for like about a month, um, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm terribly experienced um, in terms of this, although you know I've had other kind of leadership roles. But I think there are a lot of challenges in terms of really trying to establish your network um, and you know really establishing, uh, cultivating relationships among a variety of different people. Um, so that becomes sort of a challenge. So you have to reach out um, and not only have your network within, within the college or within your profession, but also extending it out um, to other, you know, other opportunities. Um, sort of prioritizing um, and getting, not getting lost in the details. I think, um, you know, I love, I love the details of things. Um, so when you're in a leadership position, you have to kind of make sure you have the details, but then look at what's the bigger picture um, and um, how do you prioritize among um, those while still not losing the specifics about what's happening. Wonderful. So yeah. I get to go last, huh? Yeah. Great. Perfect. No pressure there. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine a, a, a wonderful young woman, that would be me, in her mid-20s in the 1980s starting a role as the first woman manager in an all-male industry. It was a heavy manufacturing, it was Oneida Silversmiths, and I was the first woman manager they ever hired. And during my first few weeks, I noticed people hissing at me. <laughs> hissing at me, I'm like, I wonder why those people are hissing at me. So I kind of felt like Margaret Mead, like I'm gonna find out why all these people are hissing at me. And it was not just men, it was men and women. And I discovered that over time, that people have their own biases, they have their own beliefs, and in a heavy manufacturing environment, those beliefs were founded in tradition and they were founded in personal culture that people brought to work every day, and it really wasn't me they were hissing at, it was what I symbolized that they were hissing at, it took me a little while to figure that out, and I found that the greatest way to combat hissing is to be competent and to be consistent and that was the best training ground in the world because there was nothing else I could do. I couldn't hiss, well I could hiss back, but I didn't think it was a good strategy. 
And at first I'd go home and I'd be like, wow, they're hissing at me. People really don't like me, they're hissing at me. And then after a while I realized they don't know me well enough to hiss at me yet, so it's what I symbolize. And, and so I did begin to understand that if I'm going to live in this environment, I have to combat that by being competent and consistent. Now becoming an, competent is a, it's a journey, it's not a destination, right? Because I thought I was competent when I showed up, but you know, life changes, we continue to learn. And I, I discovered that my capacity for discomfort really helped me in my leadership role and then future leadership roles. And by discomfort, I mean, yes, I could tolerate being hissed at. I also could tolerate discovering things about myself, like I'm really not good at spreadsheets, so I need to go figure out. So, you know, in order to continue that competency journey, I had to embrace my discomfort. A lot of women don't like discomfort, a lot that I have discovered. It's like, no, I could never do that. Well, sure you could. You just don't want the discomfort of getting there. So competence and discomfort, I think, are two, two things, two lessons that I learned. And the other is that I think we have a, a natural tendency toward drama and grace. And I have discovered over time that we need to dial down the drama, and that involves discomfort, because that means we react differently to things. Dial down the drama and dial up the grace. And I think we can do anything. And I actually am surrounded by women who are very high on grace and very low on drama, except for entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I have to say. Uh, I'll just add a couple of things that um, perhaps will uh, sound familiar to many in the audience. Um, you have to uh, have the courage not to be nice when uh, being nice is not called for, and uh, at least for women of a certain generation, mine, uh, we were raised to be nice, and uh, I think niceness is, a, is an important quality in a leader, but you, it has its limits. Uh, but I, I also resist essentializing characteristics of women. We are an enormously diverse half of humanity, and so while there are certain uh, gender expectations that we are raised with, they have changed over the generations. Uh, Val Ackerman's talk earlier today was a dramatic illustration of that in the change uh, in the relationship of women to sports, girls to sports, for example. So uh, you, you are, uh, y it is incumbent on a woman leader to be aware of those essentializing stereotypes, which ones you seem to display and which ones you seem, if, if in fact we are inclined to drama, which ones you have to kind of work on in either to deploy them <laughs> for effect or to tamp them down because they could get in your way. Uh, Joyce, would you anything to that? Um, well, I think no. it just points to no. the importance of people just having self-awareness. I, I think that's one area that we're severely lacking today in leadership is people not having self-awareness and we talk about self-monitoring skills, of knowing that you need to behave a certain way in, in one audience and a different way in a different audience. And some leaders do just seem to have total lack of self-awareness of how they come across. And when we talk about leadership, it's all, in the it's all in the eye of the beholder. It's not us, it's what do people perceive. So if people perceive we're a certain way, well, then we have to take that seriously in terms of what does that tell us and how do we use that information. And so I think it's really important, I mean, it's because I come from sort of, um, you know, the importance of executive coaching, but I think that's really good advice for everybody, is to have a coach. Have somebody that you can talk to. We talk about the importance of mentors and then sponsors who really advocate for you. I think that's critical for women. Um, but I think having coaches, people that you can talk to, because everybody needs people to talk to. And the higher you move up in an organization, the lonelier it is. And the more you have no one to talk to. And so I think that's another great thing that we have Mm -hmm. I'm with our male colleagues is, and I think with Pat is, we have this opportunity to share 
things that we couldn't normally share, right? Absolutely. And I think that happens with a lot of CEOs, right? They have that opportunity to share. So you, you need to have coaches that can help you understand what are your strengths, what are the areas you need to watch out for, and then you have to take action on those, right, in terms of monitoring those things. So. Great. Still, yeah. Coming back. I think also the ethos of Villanova as an institution is really helpful to women's leadership because we have a relatively non-competitive community environment here. Uh, this is not a cutthroat culture. It's a culture that really uh, valorizes collaboration and uh, mutual respect and, and nobody's really encouraged to be a jerk. Uh, at this institution, in fact, uh, I, and, I, and it's something that I really highly value is the collaborative and cooperative culture rather than a competitive one. Uh, so I think that that is, has been an avenue to women uh, uh, feeling that they could be leaders at this institution because they don't have to change their spots, as it were. Great. Well, uh, shifting gears a little bit, we'll do one more question and then see if there's uh, uh, any questions from the audience. But uh, tonight is a very exciting night because we are formally launching the McNulty Institute for Women's Leadership. So this is, this is for us, an exciting moment for Villanova um, and uh, represents a uh, great opportunity for us, but also the generosity of Ann Welsh McNulty, one of our alums, uh, through the establishment of this institute with a $5 million gift. Uh, has really, really helped us move ahead um, in, in coalescing a lot of the programs we have around women and women's leadership, women's issues, etc. cetera. Um, and so I like, I'm like. i hoping you could all weigh in a little bit about uh, you know, what you think this institute might mean for your college, um, and, then, and then also what you might hope to see the institute uh, accomplish uh, moving forward. So um, has anyone like to go first there? I would. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. So my college was very excited when we discovered that this institute was about to be launched <coughs> for a couple of reasons. One, we actually have degrees and non-degree um, areas of study around leadership, which is, to me, great, great fun. And actually, the students who end up in those programs often will tell us, that not only was fun and interesting, but I grew and I turned into a different person. It's like, yeah, that's, that's what leadership's about. Now we have a subset of women that we're working with who have been either out of the workforce or out of, out of college, out of school for many, many years, and they're coming back and they're saying, what am I going to do? Who am I going to be? Will I be able to do this? And, and I think that's really insecurity, right? I mean, that's part of the journey is who am I? And it's wonderful that we have not only the programs that we have and the, and the women leaders that we have to work with them, but now to look at that institute and say, what could come from that? What kind of a confluence of ideas and people might come from that, and how could we use that with, with our students, or how could our students maybe one day be part of that institute? We're very excited about it. It's, it's an area we love, and we love women, of course, so uh, it's, yeah, how can you not smile when you talk about the institute? So, I, you know, we uh, in the College of Nursing, there are a number of um, issues and faculty I got, I doing work, <laughs> work in the area of many things related to, of course, women's health, um, women and mental health, um, looking at some of the critical social issues of the day, the opioid um, epidemic um, and its impact on women, um, looking at um, parenting and how do we support um, parents who are working mothers or who are uh, dealing, we're dealing with vulnerable populations. So there are many areas I think that are potential um, opportunities for us to work together with the McNulty Institute. Um, I think the other thing is since the majority of our students are women, although we have an increasing number of men in the um, profession of nursing, um, we, we have a professional development program that we call LEAD 
um, that's now just getting out, off the ground in the college, and so I think there are lots of opportunities for further development, uh, leadership development in our students in, in cooperation with the Institute. So I'm looking forward to those kinds of opportunities. Thanks. Uh, so we're very excited about this, and Terry, nice to see you here too, as well as a lot of the McNulty um, um, Council. Um, I, I think that, and Pat, probably when you were the former dean here, you started the Women's Professional Network, um, which shows, of course, commitment um, to the importance of women in leadership. Um, so for the business school, we have the Women's Professional Network, which is very active. We um, have a Women in Tech Committee that we've institutionalized, that's for VSV and Villanova. We have now a new Women in Finance group, a Wildcat Women in Real Estate group, um, that's what they call themselves. And um, so we have a number of affinity groups, but we want to partner um, in terms of programming or to whatever degree um, we can work with the Institute. And I think the Institute is important because we talked to a lot of prospective students, and just yesterday when I was talking to a student who said, tell me about the future of diversity. I'm deciding, am I really interested in Villanova or not? And I have all these other options, right? Um, and so, um, which I increasingly find myself in those conversations with students about. And so I think, you know, to be able to say we have an institute really sends a powerful message about the importance um, from the top at uh, this institution um, that Father Peter, that the provost, that our leadership really cares deeply about these issues. So I think that's really important. What I would love to see happen, because I think that was one of your questions was, um, so how do we pull together what's going on all over campus? Because I think that's the challenge, right? What are all the things that are happening as it relates to women in leadership? And then how can the Institute help us think about future trends? So not just what do we pull together, um, but how do we benchmark what other institutions, either academic or corporations are doing in terms of the space? What, what's best practice? And then just what are the future trends that we should be thinking about? So I would love for, um, you know, when we think about like what are those next kinds of things so that we can be like on the forefront of women's initiatives out there in the world. I would love for the institute to be involved in those things. But, VSB, I know, is extremely excited about this as a way of partnering with the rest of campus. Yeah, sure. Would you like to? Okay. I'll just say something. Uh, say something. I never <laughs> have any problem saying something. Uh, I will just mention that perhaps the oldest women's initiative at Villanova is the Gender and Women's Studies program, which was founded in the college in 1988 and uh, I have to say quite honestly it's never really taken off. We have a very strong faculty from different disciplines who study issues related to gender and women but it's been very difficult to get students to climb aboard and so I really am excited about this institute for the reasons that my colleagues here have mentioned, but also because I want to see this become just, uh, I would like every student at Villanova to take a course on gender studies. And, and having this very high profile institute as, as a partner and I'm looking right at you, Dr. <laughs> Boyer. Uh, I think we'll really do that because the, the value to an, anyone's education of uh, being able to uh, look at culture, look at the contemporary events uh, through the lens of gender is a really valuable skill, analytical, critical thinking skill. So that's, that's why I'm a big fan as well. And I should introduce Dr. Terry Boyer, who is the executive director of the McNulty Institute, and uh, just rejoined Villanova because she is an undergrad uh, of, of our university and has gone off and done terrific things. And so the beauty of one of the, the, the characteristics of this institute, and it, ideally all institutes, although we have some exceptions to this rule, is that an institute at Villanova, as opposed to a center, is a university-wide initiative. So actually, the, the McNulty Institute reports up through the office of the provost 
to serve so they can serve as a resource across all of the colleges and be something that uh, doesn't isn't sort of confined by whatever boundaries might exist between the colleges. So this really was a, 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 a visionary gift from Ann Welsh McNulty and uh, I think uh, really provides an opportunity for all of the colleges. So I, I think uh, we can do a little Q&A right now unless anyone has a final word. Good, so uh, does anyone have any questions that our panel can discuss with? Yes. So the question was, I'll just repeat the question so everybody can hear it, was about you know, how do you deal with issues where uh, folks are, are claiming reverse discrimination or that you're trying to over-promote women uh, in, your, in your organization and your, on your team? So how might you address that? Anyone? Um, I think that's a great question. And I think we all face that question, right? Um, but I think it goes to um, what's the organization's mission? <coughs> holistically and what is it that you're trying to do, right? And so um, I, I think we're, I'm, I'm assuming that you're um, promoting uh, equally qualified people, obviously, so that's not even the issue there. Um, but there's larger goals for an organization, especially as it's, especially in law, um, where you really need to have more women at higher levels, right? Um, very similar to business. and so. I think you're helping people to understand what are our bigger goals of what we're trying to accomplish here. And, um, and then, of course, people have to buy into what are those bigger goals of what we're, of what we're trying to do. Um, because I think that um, people have to understand why is diversity so important. I mean, for our perspective, it's really critical because every day we hear from employers who say, you know what, you're just not preparing all the people we need for diversity in the workplace. And so you need to do a better job, academic institutions, of preparing people. So we can at least say that, and our people understand that, that we need to promote um, more women, more diverse candidates, because it is important, right, for our students to see people as role models. Um, and that's part of the bigger mission of, you know, helping organizations out there. Um, but I think people have to understand what's the overall sort of mission and vision of what you're trying to accomplish. That makes sense. I, and it starts out, I would say, for the um, lawyer, the younger lawyers, it's always 50 50 yep. coming in. As we rise through the levels, the women want to have kids and have baths and different things, and it's when they're at the higher level that I want to mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Yeah. Anyone add anything to that or we go over another question? So if I can paraphrase what you just said, uh, it wasn't a question, it was a comment about uh, uh, at BlackRock and the, the, num the percent of females or women that, that are now make the financial decisions in the household and how it would be important to have women in leadership roles at a firm like that to talk to the population of folks that are making those decisions now more than 50% women, so I think that was the yeah. thrust, yes. Other questions? Or did someone have something to say about that? I'm sorry, should have asked first. Yes, more. I wonder if it needs to comment uh, a bit about uh, the nature of the conversations that you're having with your students about women leadership. Uh, I think we've got a diversity of students and a diversity of interest for folks, in it, and I just think that from that perspective, that's also important. Great, so the nature of conversations you're having with, with, with their female students about leadership. So my observation has been, and it's not just in my position as dean, but goes back farther, that uh, 
Female students are already in positions of leadership. They just don't realize it. They don't think of themselves in that way. Uh, for example, every year, approximately two thirds to three quarters of the new inductees into Phi Beta Kappa in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences are women. But if you ask them, they you know, identify yourself, uh, probably leader would not be a, a, a signifier that they would, would use. So I think that's where the power of the symbolic example comes in. But I think we do need to do more in this institute will be greatly helpful in um, sticking that label leader to certain activities that women already do and they just don't think of themselves as leaders. Yeah, I'd like to build on that. Exactly the conversation that we have with our students, especially an older student who's coming back, might have children at home and saying, I don't really want to be an organizational leader. That's not, I'm not interested because I want to be in that kind of a role. I want to spend my time in my community and with my children. And that's leadership too. And so I think one of the things that's interesting for women is to look at the, the various facets of leadership and the various ways that we use those skills to improve our community, to improve our children's lives. So one of the, that's something we look at in our leadership program is this isn't just about organizational leadership, which isn't always the most fun. Oh, Sorry. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's been a long way. It's always fun. <laughs> <laughs> so we talk a lot about um, our students as leaders in uh, nursing and healthcare, and that's so, there's a lot of conversation about what does it take to be a leader in their in wherever they are in the organization um, <coughs> that they eventually go into, um, and we do have a lot of our alums who are in very you know high level leadership positions, which is, makes for excellent role models for our students. Um, our lead program, as we've now labeled our professional development program, um, I think really has a focus on how do you prepare leaders, how do you engage um, students and others in this process, um, how do you advance, how do you develop, um, that's what lead stands for. Um, so it's all that focus on, on developing uh, leaders as they go forward. And we have, you know, really one, um, excellent student organization that we have a fabulous advisor to that organization and she really pounds that leadership into them. So they are very, you know, they run for office in the national organization, they do, um, you know, they do resolutions at the national convention. So there's a lot of opportunity um, among, in that student organization for them to develop the leadership um, component. We have to really, um, recognize the efforts of that uh, advisor for that group. She's sort of uh, tireless in doing that. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think in the, the business sector, um, you know, we have a lot of different clubs, a lot of clubs, right? And, <laughs> and our associate dean for our undergraduate program, Melinda German, right back there, and she leads all these fantastic things. Um, so I think a lot of them have women leaders. Um, they rise to the top um, because, frankly, if they got into the business school, they're pretty, I mean, you know, all, all of you who are alums are fantastic people and you had to have done a lot of things to get there. Um, I, I think that's why we actually started some of these other groups about finance, real estate, because they are so male dominated. And that we've learned, finance in particular, if you don't get involved as a freshman, then you really can't get into the leadership positions. But a lot of women don't know as a freshman that I want to be in finance. And so we're trying to educate our freshmen about career options in traditionally male disciplines, which might be finance, real estate, economics. Um, and so the other ones are a little bit much more balanced or else that we have more women in those. And so it's just get in there, get exposed in those disciplines. And then for us to also think about if you don't figure it out as a freshman, because after all, that's pretty young to figure out what you're doing, then is there another alternative route to get in there? So we have to push back on our clubs, too, and say, there's got to be other ways that people can get involved. They shouldn't have had to figure it out, you know, day one as a freshman, what they're going to try to do. 
Um, but I do think that it was a great point about um, how do women see themselves? And do they see themselves in leadership? I'm, I'm a big proponent in, um, in fact, after this, I'm doing my negotiation center, se session, you wanna say. Um, but I'm a big proponent in the importance of negotiations training um, because I think it, once again, it's about building confidence and how do you see yourself? And then putting yourself out there and um, you know, taking those kinds of risks um, so that you know, you, you actually are a leader, right? And you have to start viewing yourself in that way. But that takes a lot of practice, too, and so. Thank you. I think, you know, one of the great opportunities that we found when, when I was dean of the business school, we did survey of our alumni, was the, the power at full desire of our, our alums, our, our female alums, to uh, uh, mentor our students, but also to have professional development opportunities with each other, networking, and so the Institute and all these various programs we've talked about provide uh, uh, an opportunity for our students, but also our alumni to tap into what I think is you know, one of the key differentiators of Villanova, the, the desire of Villanovans to help Villanovans. And so sort of harnessing that power is, is, is an amazing uh, uh, thing that we use competitively uh, across the board, but even more so with just this potential that exists <clears throat> for women. So I, I, again, I would say it's, it, there's a lot to be excited about with the Institute, with these various initiatives, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and something that we're very grateful for, for all of you that are out there, whether you're uh, an alum or a parent, et cetera. Um, probably have time for one more question uh, as we draw to a close here. Any one? Yes, Jen. The biggest challenge you faced, and kind of how did you navigate that? The biggest challenge is as you navigated your way up. Besides his being his staff, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I could top that. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, being his staff was was a lot of fun. I, I think the greatest, my greatest challenge is staying the course, and not allowing myself to become discouraged, and have a very long if I want to stay and I and I want to make a difference and sometimes you have to have that conversation with yourself why am I here but I think staying the course being consistent and to the degree that you can tuning it out I mean there are times and I haven't encountered one but there are times when there's a the structure of the organization prevents you from getting to where you need to go to and sometimes you just have to leave and that's unfortunate but I have found that by being consistent and moving forward to where I think I need to move forward to that they have either gone away or they've accepted me over time. And I think people react from tradition. So I was in the SUNY institution for 20 years and people had been there a lot longer than that. So and a lot of colleagues here have been here for a long time. They have traditions and they have ways of thinking and a culture and it takes a long time for someone new to become part of the culture. And it's not like you, you have to necessarily agree with their biases, but it takes a little while for them to say, okay, you're part of us now. And so sometimes you encounter things that are like, oh my God, I'll never get past this. And sometimes just being consistent and confident will get you there. I don't know if that answered your question, but don't, don't allow yourself to implode. Somebody else? That, gosh, there's so much you can say about that, and I know we have no time. Um, so I think that's great advice, and I think being really positive, um, you know, I'm by nature a very positive, optimistic, enthusiastic person, and and I think that is good advice about, um, you, have, you also have to surround yourself with other positive people. I think that's really important, because negative people suck the energy out of you, right? We all know that. And so I think it's very important that you surround yourself with positive people. And, um, you know, and I think you have to have, I do think you have to have good mentors. I think you have to have good sponsors. I think you have to have people that you can talk to. Um, and I think you're right about every day saying, why am I doing this again? Um, because I think we all have to do that every day. We have to say, why am I doing this again? What's my purpose again? What's my vision again? What am I trying to accomplish? And it, it better have a good purpose. 
<laughs> right? In terms of a larger purpose of what are you really trying to do and the positive impact you're trying to make in your job, in your society, whatever it is. And I think you have to stay focused on that, um, that positive impact. Can I say one more thing? Um, I encountered a situation, a lot of changes in leadership where I was previously, and there was a time when all of a sudden new leaders came in and they, their view was like way over there from what I knew was the institution's view. And I was able to align, my, align myself with external people who helped me to get through that time. So I had a professional association, thank God. And I actually, and I had the, I had the latitude to serve on boards, et cetera, et cetera. It saved my life. It kept me moving forward. And it allowed me to grow over here while this was figuring itself out. And I think education has done the same thing for me. I've been like, okay, I'm gonna focus on my education. So it isn't just, that's not the whole world, right? You got a whole other world over here. So use your resources externally as well. There's a, there's a question. Oh. Why don't you, uh, yes. if you don't mind, stand up and you'll project a little yeah, more loudly. Some additional good advice, and uh, we're drawn to a close here time-wise. Um, I would thank everyone who's out there because I know, again, that how much you do to support Villanova, but also answering the call from students if they do reach out to you. Uh, please, uh, we, we appreciate that. I'm actually fond of saying we expect that as Villanova. So uh, thank you uh, for doing what is expected of you. Um, and for my part, I always learn from our deans, and uh, it really is an honor to serve. I, I am, I am uh, so grateful for your service, and uh, when I sit here, uh, uh, it, it reinforces that as it does every time we're together. You do a phenomenal job, uh, and our students are the benefactors, and our whole community are the are, uh, benefit from that. So thank you all. Thank you, the Alumni Association. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.